Um, welcome to another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast. Um, we have a special guest today and a special co-host today. Um, I'll do the co-host first. Uh, we have Coach Matt Bartley with us as a, as a guest co-host. Um, he is the confused offensive line coach at uh, Xenia High School. Uh, he is also the host of um, the Game Wreckers and Slava Knockers podcast. His uh, YouTube link will be in the in the bio. Uh, coach, how you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing good, my friend. I'm doing good. Um, and then we also have a special guest today to talk pin and pull with us today. Um, we have Matt Holscher, um, the offensive coordinator at uh, KD Seven Lakes in Texas. Coach, how are you doing? Doing great, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. No problem. Um, before we get started, I do have to give credit to our, our mutual friend who helped set this up, John Arnett, uh, friend of the channel. If, and... if, if you must. You know, <laughs> if you must. <laughs> oh, that, yeah. I mean, we could make all the jokes about John if we wanted to. I mean, you, yes, you, you've can. known him and probably that long. That's a whole other podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, that, that actually might be a good time sometime. And I need to get him back on here, anyways, at some point. So. Um, so, I, I mean, we're going to kind of get into it because I know Coach Bartley messaged me if I knew any um, pen and pull guys. Um, and I, like I said, I obviously reached out to a couple of good guys I know, and they get one well, obviously, John gave me your name. Um, so, before we even get started, for people who don't know what pen and pull is, what what is pen and pull, at least in your system? Yeah. There's, I mean, basically, it's a way, it's kind of a variation to run sweep. Um, and it's just kind of a way to, you know, if you, you know, people kind of have this different, I say, contrasting view about getting the ball to the edge, getting the ball to the outside, um, some variation of a of an outside run. Um, but it's it's really just kind of a way to, for us, it's a way to take the ball to the C to the D gap. Okay, one of the two, and it's it's just kind of a variation that allows you to use um, angles. A lot of times, I think if you have really tough blocking assignments, if you're playing teams that are that are pretty talented up front, you know, sometimes you really scratch your heads on how can we actually find a way to move these guys. And so it's a way to take advantage of angles and, and allow you to just basically pin them down. And then at the same time, if you do have some players who, who can, who can move a little bit, who have some capacities to pull and get on the edges, um, it allows them to kind of get out in space a little bit and kind of gives you some advantages in that regard. Okay. Um, so what, I mean, I mean, we'll just jump right into it then. Like, from a rule standpoint, how does that work for your offensive line? Because I know that's probably what Coach Bartley's probably most interested in himself. Is. You took my first question. I was going to ask, okay, yeah. so are you rules-based or are you a defense-based? Like, if it's a 40, it's this. If it's a 30, it's this. Yeah, it's it's a play for us that you have to kind of, you know, the scheme can change. And one of the challenges of it is the way we do it, we're always trying to get two guys pulling. Um, and for us, the easy rule we've made is our center is always going to be a puller. So it's always going to be the center plus one for us. Um, the other person is going to be the play side guard or the play side tackle. That's going to be totally dependent on where we have the angle, uh, who can get the block down and who can move. So in times that's going to be the tackle blocking down and the guard pulling. Uh, there's other times where the guard is blocking back and then the center is having to pull. So a lot of it's just the, the variation of how the defense lines up and where we have the angle that's going to allow us to get pullers out. Coach, how do you deal with like defenses that are that do a lot of stemming? Then? It's like, tough. You know, they're yeah. going to start and then they're they're jumping late, things like yeah. that. Yeah, one, one of I would say one of the big challenges to the play is is if you do get a lot of movement, um, that is going to be something we're going to be pretty cautious about. If we do get a lot of teams that that say play, you know, head up four and then they slant into a three, that is something that can kind of trick with the play a little bit. Um, so a lot of times we are looking for that as far as in particular, you know, when we're doing our scheming and we're doing our game planning, we're really trying to kind of find times where we can get them settled, uh, because that is something that does sometimes blow the play up a little bit. Um, so most of the time, you know, we're, we're trying to get it to where we're not having a lot of movement, but in some cases, we, even if they do move, you know, you have a good enough angle to where they're kind of sometimes moving themselves away from the play. So a lot of that kind of goes into your game planning and your scheming. Um, as far as situationally, when you want to call it, when you want to run it. Now, where, now for when you get, do get those problems, what are your usual answers for that? Um, you know, a lot of it comes from, you know, just basically, I'd say the concept is, you know, can we do, do we have enough information? Do we have enough 
um, stuff going into a game plan and a scheme to to make an adjustment. Um, there's, and I'll be honest with you, there's times when if we're playing a team that is truly moving around a lot and it's, and it's going to give us a lot of problems with movement and we feel like it's not a very good play, um, we might be more uh, likely to run counter against them. Or we might be you know, more likely to run something else. Um, but yeah, the movement aspect of it is definitely one that kind of slows you down. Um, you know, sometimes if we feel like even with the movements that we have a good enough angle and we have enough of the capabilities to get outside and run with them, then we still feel like we can get to the edge. We will. Do you have any like particular coaching points for your running back on this play as well? Yeah. The, the biggest thing he's got to do is be patient. Um, you know, a lot of that is because he's for, in our system and the way we do it, he's waiting for the second puller. Um, so he's waiting for the center okay, to basically clear and get out. Now we always tell him if you are out in space and you see open space run, and as I'll show you guys some clips, there's times when he clearly just outruns the center and just continues to move forward because he's, he's not going to wait for him forever. Uh, but there's times when he's, his aiming point and the starting point is always going to be um, basically to the butt of the tight end. And then the center has been obviously told his depth, his path needs to kind of follow and track very close to that. And so he's aiming at that point. And then from that point, once the tailback is out in space, it's his space. He's got he's to make his cuts adjust and kind of go from what he sees. But we do tell him you, there is a, a, an aspect of the play that you do need to be a little bit patient. You do need to allow your pullers to get out in space. You know, if you get tackled by the Mike backer and you've outrun your puller, that's probably not what we want. You know, that's, that's not going to be pretty beneficial to us. So we're, we're going to tell him to be patient in a, in a similar stance that you would say be patient when running counter. Um, I kind of take the same approach. You know, be patient, allow your pullers to give themselves a chance to set their block up. Coach, you talked about being tackled by the mic. That gets me one, another question I had is how do you deal with linebacker run through? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, basically I tell my guys it's going to be, um, you know, once the ball is snapped, you, you do have guys that you're responsible for. You know, this is a concept where a lot of times when you have linemen out in space, you know, and I've heard people say, you know, when they're out in space, they're in someone else's land. So you just kind of tell them the first thing you see. But we do have, you know, based on the scheme, people they're going for. You know, there, there is a responsibility. So I always tell my center, you know, your center is going to be responsible in most defenses for the Mike Backer. If that Mike Backer blitzes through, you got to stay with him. All right. So you have to be aware and you have to know. And there is times when you open the pull and that Mike Backer triggers right into you. Well, take him. You know, if he's right there and he triggers and he's right in your face, don't bypass him and don't run him. That's your assignment coming to you. Make it as easy as possible and stay on him. Um, and I think that's an easy way to do it. Uh, triggering linebackers is another challenge to the play. You know, anything when, when you're pinning down and you're pulling, um, you know, stuff that is triggering in your face very fast um, is a challenge. It's difficult. And a lot of times, you know, you have to tell your, your pullers in particular, as soon as you get locked on, you got to stay on and you got to try to give us what you can. You know, in, in some cases, the play gets blown up to the point where we're not going to get much, but if we at least get contact, you know, maybe we have a chance to have a positive yardage play, get something out of it. Gotcha. What? Well, okay, so if you, let me ask you this, if you have, like, we see about every defense, don't we, Nick? I mean, like, we literally see every de defense. Yeah, it's, it's, probably, it's probably slowly trending to more odd defenses, but, yeah, I mean, you yeah. get, there's four, th there's, uh, there's one, four, three, there's a couple four two fives. There's quite a bit of three fours, which are a mixture of like the old school five two and the true three four. Um, am I missing anybody? I think that's every. No, I, th I think that's about it. So, do you guys kind of see the same defenses every week, or does it like for us? It and then sometimes we just get the defense of the week a dial it down defense sometimes yeah. some of these guys. Uh, we, we get we get some variations for sure i'd say the majority of what we face would be would be three four defenses odd defenses and in that we get some variations um this year we saw everything from three three stack to four two five to you know straight you know four three middle you know middle fronts mm -hmm. uh, but i'd say the majority of what we see is, is, a, is an odd front three four defense so that, that for me, then I would say like you're going to be pulling your tackle more than your. Yeah, I would say a majority of the time, the two pullers for us is going to be your is going to be your tackle and your center. 
Um, and most of the time, that's going to be the pullers. We're going to get some fronts, and like I said, we'll play different defenses. You know, one of the things I like about it is if you if you do have you know the variations and you feel confident about your guys athletically being able to pull, in particular if you have a side of the line where you know center guard tackle can all pull, then obviously that that makes the play pretty valuable when you've got three guys who can pull and that can change depending on fronts and alignments. We can kind of take advantage of how they line up to allow our guys to get out. Okay. Okay. Now, is there any, I mean, you mentioned just a couple of things there, but did you, uh, is there any particular formations you have a preference to run them out that you think you gives you, gives you a little more advantage than some other ones? Yeah, we're, we're definitely, um, you know, our, our primary formation to run it out of is going to, we're going to be 11 personnel. You know, we're going to be tied in attached. And obviously we, we have to have him to have that surface to be able to kind of guarantee that that down block and allow us to take over. Um, I've, I've seen some people, and we've done it a little bit, running it out 21, kind of inserting either another a fullback or if you're a 12 personnel team, inserting another tight end, okay, which can kind of give you some other, other you know, variations to do it out of. Uh, but for us in particular, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an 11 personnel or a 21, you know, something where we're going to have a tight end. What does your backside do on, on it? I mean, are they, they're, are they they're, full, they're, yeah, they're going to be full zone on the backside. Um, we're going to open up and run. And that's one of the, you know, one of the challenges, which is a little bit difficult. We do play a lot of teams that play head up noses. And so one of the, the things that's difficult when pulling the center is if you have a, a play side guard blocking down on a head up nose and your backside guard is zoning, there's sometimes it's kind of that wedge in the middle where he has a hard time, you know, getting by and climbing. He doesn't need to block the nose. The nose is getting blocked down on by the play side guard. So we actually tell him to kind of widen his split, have a little bit more depth. So that's going to allow him to kind of bypass the nose, climb to the second level. And so they're going to be just full zone on the backside. And a lot of times it's just, you know, just outside zone, just open and run. And then if they're at the second level, you know, if you can get to those backside backers, that's great. If you can throw and cut, get them on the ground, that's great. Uh, but it's just a full zone backside rule for them. That's what I was about to ask you. I mean, how, how much, I mean, obviously your backside guard, you, you use some, what, what I call smart splits. Is there anybody else in the play that you, you try to have a preference with their smart, uh, smart splits to mess with people? Yeah, the, the, the tight end in particular, uh, if he's blocking down on a defensive end, you know, one of the things that you'll show you in our, in our video is if it's anywhere from a, Inside shade seven or head up eight, uh, you know, a, uh, a five, a head up four, you know, he's going to be blocking that guy. So his splits and his alignment are going to be kind of based off of the guy he's blocking. Even in some of our instances, if he's inside shade four eye and we just really want to get our tackle out, we think he can get underneath and handle that four eye, then he needs to tighten up, needs to choke up a little bit uh, because he's got a pretty long way to go to get down in there and pin that guy. So I'll, I'll show you a video cut of that. Uh, we really prefer that tight end to be able to take that defensive end and get the tackle out. That's our best variation to probably run it out of. So his split's got to be, you know, it's got to be knowledgeable based off where the defense is lining up. Yeah. What, so I would assume if you're doing this, you're you. It's not the only run scheme you have. You probably run zone as well. Do you run Absolutely. anything else? Yeah. Like, so we, I mean, we have a pretty, you know, we do a lot of stuff with tight ends. We're a pretty big tight end run team. We have tied in attached runs. Uh, we have tied in, you know, kind of as a sniffer back off the ball in a more open set. Um, this is obviously one of our probably more productive um, concepts of getting the ball to the edge, running outside. We like to run wide zone, both to the tight end and into the open ended side. Um, we run inside zone, power counter. Uh, we have a lot of different run variations that we do. Um, but I think this is, this is one that in particular I, I do like because I have noticed throughout the couple of years we've been doing it, uh, explosive plays, um, runs of 12 plus or more for us. We get quite a few off this concept. I, I curiosity, how much, cause I, I was actually listening to another video I have editing earlier. How much do you track explosive plays throughout the season? Every, we, we track them every week. Um, explosive plays are. One of our main goals that we do and we kind of track as a team is what we refer to as the double positive. And that's, I think it's done off of a study. I want to say it's University of Texas, uh, which basically tracks statistics on, you know, what correlates and leads to success and victory in games. 
And the two things they kind of matched up is pretty consistent were winning the explosive play battle against your opponent, winning the turnover battle. If you could do those two things in a game, your chances of success were very, very high. I want to say somewhere in the 90, 90%. Um, so we do that. We've been tracking that as a goal for several years now. We found that it's a pretty good indicator. If we're, you know, you know, not turning the ball over and we're having somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 explosive plays a game, um, then we're going to have a pretty good chance to win. Now, what, what do you guys classify? Is there a difference between your running pass on explosive plays? Where, where are the yeah, numbers? We, we, we cl yeah, we classify 12 yards for a run and 16 for a pass. Okay. How, how expensive is, of a series is this to teach? Like, so we're going to be a, a, ga a huge gap scheme team, yeah. a little bit of man team, not going to do any, a whole lot of zone, if any. How expensive of a series is to put in Pinnacle? Uh, I've, I've found that our guys pick it up relatively fast. You know, it's it's really, um, you know, blocking schemes and blocking down. The one thing that you have to do, obviously, is they have to spend time on understanding the rules and concepts of am I pulling or am I or am I blocking down because you're doing one or the other. Um, but really, you're putting it on your really it's your tackle and your guard. Uh, the center knows he's pulling. Uh, the tight end typically knows he's blocking the defensive end. Uh, the backside guys know that they're full zoning. All right, so really what you've done is you've really put it on two guys. Two guys kind of have to have a good understanding of knowing what they're doing, um, and they have to know the rules and the variations. But for everybody else, the, the teaching and the rules of it are pretty consistent. So when you're teaching, like, is there any particular drills you'd use to teach this? But, I mean, mainly the front side, obviously, back the scooping, zoning, back side, that's pretty uniform. Yeah. But front side, how do you, from a practice standpoint, drill that? Yeah, the, the, the big challenge – uh, and probably what needs the most, you know, I think the, the blocking down in the gap schemes, you know, and that's also why it's a good is how much time do you spend working on gap schemes, you know, tied in blocking down. We're, you know, we're tied in teams. So our tight ends spend a lot of time on gap schemes. Our guards and tackles spend time on gap schemes. So blocking down and pinning somebody, um, that's kind of built into what we do almost every day. Uh, the trick is, is the guys on the pole. Uh, those are the t those are the things that you do have to spend time on, and in particular, I think it's that first puller. Um, it's the tackle or the guard getting out in space, because as they move out in space, they're going to lock up and they're going to have contact quickly. They're going to have to sustain their block for a longer period of time, uh, and so showing them different looks, showing them what happens. Let's say if a Sam backer triggers off the edge, and you don't have a chance to just reach him, you got to kick him out. Um, if he tries to spike underneath you and you don't have the ability to square him up, you got to get your head on the shoulder and you got to try to pin him. Um, what if he sits in the hole and he doesn't do anything? Um, what is your technique and, and what do you try to do from there? So the first puller I think is the, is the one you have to spend the most time on. The second puller, um, a lot of times because of the timing of the play, the amount of contact he has to have typically with the Mike backer is relatively small. He's got to get on him and usually if he's on him for half of a second, then the tailback is by him. If he can just get to his get to his landmark and make some level of contact, okay, then usually we have a chance to have a good play. But I would say make, the, the, the big the big thing we will spend time on is those pullers, you know, showing them different looks. You know, you guys talked about earlier. What happens if the mic triggers in the B gap? You know, how do I make that adjustment? What happens if the Sam on the outside edge just totally spikes and comes inside? You know, what if he tries to cut you, um, almost like you would on counter? Um, so you see these different variations about people trying to play this. You know, that's where you do have to spend some time. Coach, do you, do you, do you teach your guys to make line calls so they know, like, hey, I'm, I'm leaving, or do you do anything yeah. like that? Yeah, try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, the guy who knows he's pulling gives a, gives a me, me call. And then he, that, that gets communicated back with the other guy, you, you. It's me, me, and you, you. So they, they know that you're going and I'm staying. So just that simple. Do you do any pass pro with a pin and pull concept? You definitely can, and we have. Um, and I'll, I'll show you. I've got a little variation that I, that I can show you. It is a play that I think does kind of set up a little bit for some RPO stuff. I know lots of teams have thrown some RPO stuff um, off of it. We've not really got a whole lot into the details of that. We have used it as, a, as an RPO and as a tag. Just we haven't really executed and called it a whole lot. Um, but we do have some variations off how to do it. Um, I think as a pass protection in particular, if it's, if it's something that's relatively situational, it actually does kind of, you know, work pretty well as a pass pro. 
Um, now, I think you do have to get the ball off relatively fast at quarterback. Um, the, the issue a lot of times for us is you're full zoning the backside. So if you are going to try to you know pull the ball and throw it, how are you protecting that backside edge with the tackle? Um, right. What are you doing? For us, it's very simple. If we feel like we're going to, we're going to, you know, read and then pull the ball and throw it, or we feel like we have a throw tagged onto it and we're going to need a little bit of time and our quarterback feels like he needs time. He just goes up and he gives a lock call lock basically tells the backside tackle you're on that tells the guard he's on the nose. So those guys basically are protecting the backside. We're giving up the backside backer um, as far as if for whatever reason we did hand it off. Um, but that at least guarantees we have protection on the backside. But I've, I've seen a lot of different people run variations in particular in the RPO game um, off of it. And it does kind of mesh up pretty well, I think. Cool. All right. Are you mainly in shotgun? Yes. Yeah, we, we're we're pretty much exclusively in shotgun. Um, you know, short yarded situations is coming out goal line. Those kind of things will get under center. Um, but we're, we're pretty much 95% of the time in the gun. Right. So I, cause I was wondering like the footwork for the center, if quarterbacks under, how is, you know, if he's going to, if he's going to go to his right, like how has that changed? Yeah. We've, path? we've never, we never really have attempted it out of anything under the under center center. So okay. I think it's a play that if you just kind of structurally see it, uh, it does definitely, you know, work better just kind of structurally if you're doing it out of the gun. Um, I just think it's an easier play that way for sure. And then having played center, you know, having to pull and, and, you know, your footwork having to be pretty spot on if you've got the quarterback rolling, you know, rolling out behind you, you know, right. those things have to time up pretty well. You flip your offensive lineman. We don't. Um, it's, it's something that I think is, is definitely look, you know, it's warranted at looking at if you do run this play. Um, there, there's one of the things that always comes up is, You've got guys pulling. You've got guys getting out in space on the edge. Clearly, some of them are going to be better than others. Some of them are going to be more talented at it. So you sometimes do run into a, a, a problem of we run this play, but we typically run it two one way, two one direction. Flipping linemen, I think, is a good variation. If you do it, this, I think, fits up pretty well because you can kind of get you know who you want, where you want. And I think that's a good way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, to your point, what actually from a personnel standpoint across your line, what do you look for? I'm curious about that. That's what I've been thinking about the past couple of minutes. Yeah, I mean, when we do this, obviously, you know, in our offense, you know, we're shotgun based offense. Um, we're pretty multiple, and I say we're relatively diverse in what we do. We put a lot on our center. Our center is a player that has to really know the offense very well. They've got to be smart. They've got to be athletic. Um, typically that's going to be one of our, you know, one of our better players is going to have to play that position and typically one of our more athletic players, um, you know, personnel wise, we played a district that, you know, has pretty good defensive ends. Um, so kind of traditionally we want our tackles to be our longer, taller, uh, guys, but you know, we really do kind of value guys that can move. Um, we, we like to be able to use speed and, and try to have guys that can, you know, take advantage of positions, take advantage of angles. Uh, get out the space and so you know we, we we've got guys that are decent sized but you know we can play with guys that are 220 225 if they can move and they can run so first thing i'm going to show y'all just kind of gives you our base look and our base rules on how we do this so this would be you know kind of our formation um just kind of our, our basic cards we have as far as how we would do it so you can see there for us we're always looking to get the uh always looking to get the center out you know we, we get a lot of this you know, style of defensive front, three-man front, uh, nose a lot of times shaded strong to the tight end. Uh, so we're getting the, the the tackle out, getting the center out. Tight end's got the down block. Guard's got the down block, full zone on the backside. And then we're, you know, just kind of perimeter run rules on the other side. We're trying to lock up one and two. We'll do some different little variations on, on how we'll do this. Sometimes we can, um, if we're in, let's say, a single – Let's say a single receiver side, we can go crack the safety and replace. Um, there's different little variants on how to do this. So let me just take you through and show you show you a couple of ways which we do this. So this is kind of a base look. We, we run this out of quite a bit. So we're in a tight end set, 11 personnel. So just kind of bear with me here. I'll kind of take you through it. So right now, it's kind of based off angles. So we'll kind of run through and show you, but we're getting two down blocks, full zone on the backside. So in this look right here, Okay, we're getting out, getting out the guard, getting out the center. Okay, guards looking to reach that first level guy. 
his rules basically, as we always tell them, you know, your, your position is based off of what they do. If they're going to run up the field, you're not going to be able to reach them. Kick them out. Okay. If they spike you, get your head, get your hat position, keep your feet moving, keep those guys pinned. Okay. So whatever they give, okay, this is what you take. Second puller, same deal. Okay. Remember, we talked about his, you know, his position, his alignments. Just keep moving. You know, it's kind of the same rule that you would have on screens. Um, just keep moving. All right. Sometimes we're not going to get there. We talked about, you know, sometimes our back, he's following, he's waiting for you to set up. And if he sees he's got a path, he's got to go. All right. So it's kind of what we get there. So that kind of gives you a good look at it. You know, on the outside edges, it's just, you know, just, just perimeter run rules. So right there, just based off angles, just kind of show you tight ends got an inside angle. He's going to try to pin there. Tackle's got the inside angle. He's going to pin. Guard and center opening up and running. Backside guys just trying to full zone and get cut off. And then just keep working, keep climbing. Coach, what's their pull technique? Are they more of a square pull or are they a skip pull? Or So I usually, I usually like to teach them just to square up and run. Our center just really was very comfortable at skip pulling when he does this. Um, I think it's easier to just open up and run. He felt much more comfortable skip pulling. He was a, really a converted guard, played a lot of guard, and we skip pull on our power stuff, stay square. He just felt more comfortable doing it that way. Um, he, he didn't really have any issues as far as, you know, getting to the next level and bypassing and getting by. You know, my, my concern on it sometimes is kind of what you'll see here is if we skip pull – and we're and we're too square, um, and we don't see what's in you know what's in front of us. And so I'll kind of give you an example here. Um, this would probably be a good example of where I wouldn't want him skipping skip Paul, although he does, because right there we get a little bit of blowback from that defensive end. He comes off pretty low and rocks is pretty good. So obviously his path is you know a little bit in jeopardy as he's pulling right there. He well, just he felt com- he felt comfortable. He felt comfortable with it. He said, he just, I just feel better opening up and doing it. And I said, if you feel good doing it, get out in space. I'm not going to mess with you. Now, is he is he trying to just clear the tight end? I noticed the guard on the one play looks like he was, like, trying to trade paint with the tight end. Is, are, are there, is there a path dependent on what their linebacker is, or are they trying to get to a point? Yeah, I mean, I'd like for them to get a little bit more depth. You know, I, I kind of like them to open up and stretch this out a little bit. The idea a lot of times is if you if you get some depth and you work outside, that a lot of times those outside edge players are going to work out with you. So you're kind of creating natural space just by your path and by your alignment. Um, I think we're probably a little tight here. We're playing a little bit tight. We're kind of forcing those guys to come up and get into us. If you stay outside and they stay outside with you, nothing wrong with that. Um so we're probably a little bit, a little tight here with regards to how, you know, how much depth we're getting. We could probably be deeper, uh, have a little bit more space to work. A pretty good job on the tackle. And what we're looking for, just technique-wise, with the tackle, we want to get those guys square. I prefer, obviously, to always give our backs two-way reads. Um, in this, in this point right here, you know, he's got a chance to obviously work the ball to the edge. But you know, based off of what he sees right there, you know, he's got some, he's got some options with the football. Just continue to work. Continue to work your hat. A little bit of a different, you know, same team, but different front. So it kind of shows, you know, one of the challenges is that you can't really scheme it sometimes as center and tackle you're pulling because sometimes they're going to give you different things. Okay, sometimes it's center guard. Sometimes it's center tackle. So same team, different front. Obviously, we had to know our rules and, and change up how we're doing this. A little different variation here. One, we talked about one of the big challenges. I'll go and show you the end zone of this. This is one of the more difficult things is it's kind of based off of alignment. We now have a head up four. We have an inside shade, or excuse me, inside shade four eye and a head up nose. So one of the th- questions is how do you treat the four eye? Um, he's inside shade of the tackle. Um, what do you do with the tight end here? Um, so really, I think it just kind of depends on what you feel comfortable with. You know, what's, what variation of the play do you feel good? There's some people who, who might look at this play and say, maybe we only get one puller out. Um, you know, maybe that's maybe we full zone the tight end, try to work him out. 
um, block down on the on the four eye, block down on the nose, and pull the center, and just get one guy out in this. Um, you know, a lot of that I think is just film work. What's that four eye going to do? Um, how's he going to play? Is he a hard slanter? Is he a pincher? Um, it's a variation of, of how they can line up, which can kind of cause some some issues. Um, for us, you know, most of the times and most of the teams we play, we don't get a whole lot of just hard, you know, just gap, you know, rushing, pinching guys. Guys are pretty good readers. Um, they're going to, you know, use their hands, kind of see and play what they see. And so I'll kind of show you this one. Same deal here. We're going to get a four eye. Our tight end's still going to work down. Now, there's a lot of space there. He's got to take good steps because he's got to cover a lot of ground. Um, really through some film study, we think that that guy's at least going to play. He's going to read and see. He's not going to try to blaze up the field. We get a good kind of pinch down there. Tackles for placing. As he steps out there, he reads that that guy kind of redirects. Has to set the edge. So now just take him and run him. Try to create as much space as possible. Center pulling, get up in the hole. Take what you can. And move that guy as best as you can. Back. You know, we're crossing here. We're not in the pistol on this one. We're coming across the formation. Open up. Follow, follow your, you know, follow your center. And get north and south. Is center reading that first, that first block? Is he, is he reading it like the, like the, the, the backside guard on Buck Sweep? Like absolutely, like, yeah, yeah. He's uh, watching that guy. You know, he, he's seeing what he's going to get. There's times, and I'll show you one here later, um, where we get that guy hooked and pinned inside. You know, he gets pinned inside. You know, he slams underneath. He, he tries to, you know, crash down. We get him hooked and pinned. So it's just like anything else. If you're that second puller, you can't get knocked off. You can't um, get, get you know, you know, butted up by any type of movement. You know, your job is to be clean and continue to keep running and work up the field. So you do kind of have to have your eyes on moving forward what you see, but also on your on your on your target, okay, which in this case is going to be our Mac backer. Now, I, I keep noticing your backside tackle there instead of more of a full zone or you have him on a couple of these more, why, why is it call a scoop to hinge? Is that? No, he's, he's got to go. He's, he's pretty much wrong here. <laughs> okay. That's what he's I was wondering because I've to, seen a one, yeah. two plays. Okay. He's got to open up and he's got to try to climb. I mean, really on the backside of this, we're not worried about the backside end. Um, the only exception to that is if for whatever reason we're going to throw an RPO or the quarterback, we have okay. some kind of a pass tagged off of this. If he gets a lock called and that tackle's locking on him, uh, but there's definitely not a lot call on this. He needs to climb and he needs to go to the next level. We do a lot of this. We'll try to motion guys around them. This is a play where I think just by alignment and formation, you know, you can really just kind of take some guys out of the play. And so we're doing that here. We're trying to motion guys to get guys, you know, situated where we want them. And then we get a little bit of a, a different look here. So a four man front. A little tougher on the tight end. Doesn't have quite as good of an angle. He's really got to come off and just try to lock up and get that guy pinned. So he's got a tough job there. You know, just kind of try to occupy that guy. Run him as, as good as he can. Stay on him. You know, lots of linemen pulling. Get out there in space and run. And that center's not – that's not a devastating block by the center. He's no, just kind of like, I'm going to get in your get in your way make the, and let the running back do his deal. Yeah, and I, I think that's kind of one of the things – I kind of mentioned it earlier – um, that first block, he's got the tough gig. Now, really, it's the tight end that's got the toughest job. All right? the, the tight end is going to be one-on-one. -on -one. He's got an angle, but he has to hold and withstand that block for a long period of time. This is a good example. Like, that's that's a tough job for the tight end from start to finish. He's having to hold that block for, for a pretty good chunk. The first puller, and in this one, it kind of works out a little bit better because the outside player, you know, Sam Backer just kind of stretches it. Um, we don't have to have a whole lot of contact, but the amount of contact – that center has to make is usually very small. The time he's locked on, the time that play usually gets by is usually just that fast. But so really, you know, we talk about, you know, you guys out in space, it's really just occupying for a short period of time. And I think that's kind of one of the benefits, you know, if you're having to, you know, full zone in some cases and stay on these guys for, you know, two, three seconds to have a chance to, you know, hit a, hit a wide zone play, that's tough. Um, this gives us some, you know, a little bit of, uh, a benefit just because we have angles and we're also having them run side to side. And I think that does give you some advantage when you have, you know, backers triggering downhill, um, you know, shortening that time to get to the play. I think sometimes that's working in their favor. When these guys are running side to side, I don't think they're in the, in the same, 
you know, comfort level as they normally would be. You kind of see it here. Like they, they don't really quite know how to play, what to expect on this. You know, it, it's, it's tough. You have guys, you know, out in space coming at you, but you still obviously have to break down and contain to make a play. I don't have quite as good of a, an end zone shot of this, but it does kind of highlight that one part, you know, right? We have contact right there from the center, then that's really all it takes. You know, relatively fast to get through the play and to the next level. All right, so I think this is a good one. But this kind of goes back into um, linebacker run-throughs, which you guys talked about earlier. You know, one of the challenges you have is, you know, I have a read, I have a guy I'm working to. What happens when I get run through? How do I adjust to it? So right now we've got the same deal. We've got, you know, got a tight end blocking down. We've got tackle pulling. We now have obviously center pulling. But you get the mic and you get the center's guy who now triggers. So what does he do? He's got to eyeball him. He's got to see him. Sit there and pin inside. So it's a pretty good job by the center just being aware uh, of what's coming at you, knowing where your assignment is. And then being able to just read off of it and then take him and make a play. We see a lot of this defense. Just this is pretty common for us. We get a lot of head up nose, head up fours. Um, you know, that's a, that's a pretty big front we see quite a bit of. So good job by the center. He just sits back, turns, and just seals the guy. You get a lot of that. You get a lot of the of that line that front side linebacker triggering especially when the guard blocks down not a lot um really not a lot um we, we haven't seen a ton of it um you know really like i said we're always trying to scheme this play where we don't think we're going to get a ton of run through or you know situation wise there's obviously times when i don't think it's quite as good it's a really good open field run i feel like first and 10 second and manageable um you know, those are good situations to run it I'm a little more gun shy about it in a, in a, a third down and, and, you know, let's say third and medium to third and short situation. If I think we're going to, in particular, if I think we're ever going to get heated up with anything, if it's second long, third and long, um, I think we've got, you know, some chance of some kind of pressure. I'm a little more hesitant uh, to call this play. But as far as an open field run and a manageable situation run play, I think that's where typically where it works best. This is kind of another little different variation. So I know a lot of the stuff I've shown you guys by formation has been the same. So it's kind of a different way to us to do it. Um, and this one a couple of years ago, just did that basically out of a bunch formation. There's a couple of things for us. We ran it this way. It actually gives us another puller. You can kind of see that's our extra tied in. This is a 12 personnel concept. Our extra tied in is just going to open up run. He's going to work up to the safety. Um, really with this one, we don't do a really good job on this. We kind of bypass the inside backer. Our first puller should be over there trying to work to that next level guy. But just kind of just by formation, showing you some different variations on how you can do it. I love this. We're gonna, I absolutely love this. I like yeah. this. This as a defensive guy, I used to stay up late nights cussing offensive coordinators because of for, stuff like this. For thinking of stuff like this. Yeah. Right. <laughs> This is yeah. beautiful. I've got a lot of different little wrinkles off of it. You know, we ran the we ran the option off of it earlier in the game. <laughs> uh, hand, hand the ball off the the receiver and off the other side. Oh god. So there's a lot of different stuff going on there. Well, this is the stuff because because I, I just got an offensive coordinator job. This is the stuff I, I I like look for the little wrinkles like oh we're gonna run bunch and then fake it fake a reverse and run pin this kind of stuff is just yeah. great. There's yeah, a, lot, a lot of different things going on there. We don't even execute it really well. You know, the guy that we really need to make sure we block is 45 here. We totally bypass him. Our running back does a good job of just staying on his track and running hard to get to the next level, getting downfield. Um, right there, you know, that's this. This is one of those plays where you know this was a this was an add in. It was a put in. So you know, making sure everybody knows, you know, hey. I structurally, this is the guys we need to continue to look at when we run this. In particular, when you add extra blockers to the play, that dynamic of if we have extra guys, who does the extra guy go to and how does that change my rule and responsibility? Um, that's something that you do need to spend some time on. 
would would the guard be responsible for 45 since he's the second puller? Yeah, so right here, everything out works in. Um, everything was going to work in one. So right now, the second blocker is going to take his responsibility. So that mm-hmm. tight end that's working out, he's taking the he's taking the guard's responsibility, and the guard's working back in. So the guard should be working into 45 there. Yeah, if, if he does that, that play is uh, a skating game. Yeah. And I always tell him this. I really like showing him this play. I always tell, if you watch my guard right here, you can go back to it here. It's always important to know who you're blocking, know who your assignment is, because you, you block the right guy here. You know, we scored anyway, but we we'll probably make it a little bit easier on ourselves. Watch the old guard. Doesn't block the right guy. Get him over there. This guy right here out in space, and look what happens to him. There you go. <laughs> make sure you know your rules. <laughs> know your rules, and that doesn't happen. So another little variation. So I talked earlier, you know, different looks that you're going to see from the tackle. Tackle guard pulling, you know, what's going to be the variations that you're going to get. Um, one of the things we work on on this play is when we pull, we get kickouts, we get logs, we get, you know, squaring up guys, we get guys, you know, maybe trying to cut us, we get guys, you know, playing back off the ball, sitting in space. So when you get all those different variations, you know, what do you do? This was a good example. You know, we, we pull out, we open up, don't really read it very well. It just kind of sits inside. And so our guard, as he's, as he's pulling, we get the, you know, right on this one, we're going to get, you know, the tackle opening up and then the center opening up. But you can see right there, he opens up. He's going to open up over there to the other side, and he's going to get that guy pinned. And you kind of see just right there, get him pinned. You can have placement, just keep it. Keep them inside. All right, take what they give you. But when you open up, you run, they're there, take them and pin them and keep them inside. Same deal we talked about with the running back. Once you're out in space, if you beat the guard or you beat the center, he's a center. You know, set him up, you have time, but now that we're out in space, go run. We'll get to the next level. You like to use a lot of formations and motions as window dressing, don't you? That's what I'm noticing. I do. I do. Um, there, there's times, obviously, you know, in the course of this game, um, right there, that motion, we're going to run basically our jet sweep. We're going to hand that. Yeah. Um, so there, there is going to be – typically there's going to be things we're going to do to obviously, you know, have some window dressing, kind of, you know, make it look a little more confusing, get their, you know, get their reads off key a little bit. You know, we like this one. If I'll show you the wide, we knew that this, this was a pretty big man team. So we're going to motion them across. We're going to get that outside defender out of the picture. And so there's there, there's kind of some some rhyme or reason to it. But, um, yeah, we do a lot of that. And then, you know, a lot of times we're going to do it, but we're going to do it based off of something other that we do. You know, we will, you know, pitch this ball uh, and get that to our receiver. All right, so one other thing that we do, and like I say, we talk about changing responsibilities. This was from a couple of years ago, so I know they've instituted a lot of new rules with with cracks and, and working into the box. So this is something that obviously we, we do that a lot of times gets called today. There's still ways we can do it. Um, you can see our outside receiver, he's working into the box. He's working to that next level guy. And then we have our other guys pinning and pulling. Now their responsibilities go on to the next level. Um, you know, there are ways we can kind of go in there and legally set up blocks, take advantage of some angles. If we have players that we know, um, we're just worried about, like in particular, that Mike backer, if we know that Mike backer just flies out of there. Our center's really going to have a hard time, um, you know, just getting there and getting, you know, properly aligned to him. Uh, then having somebody else go in there and work and having them replace, uh, is one way we can do it. So we can kind of work in, set that up, crack there. A um, little tougher today, and we, we've talked about, you know, the, the rules of it and, and the structure of it's a little different. Um, but that's one way of which we can kind of trade off. You can take these outside receivers. You know, for us, it's our outside receiver, sometimes a fullback, a second tight end. We can work them into the box and then replace the, the you know, first puller or the second puller, really depending on who we're having problems with, uh, replace them with an assignment to the next level. This is also kind of a good one to look at because we get 
really a, a, a different formation here. So something pretty rare. We don't see a lot of this. But we're going to get a really wide outside edge player nine. We don't have anybody for the tight end to really work down to. So the question now we'll look at is tight ends have been basing. They've been blocking, you know, blocking down on the four, blocking down on the four eye, you know, blocking a, a head up six, you know, you know, blocking down on a seven. Well, now all of a sudden there's nobody to block down on and you've got a wide nine. So schematically, what do we do? This situation, we like our tight end um, to kind of open run and reach. You know, it's going to change the dynamic of it a little bit, uh, but really we just say go out there, reach them, you know, run your feet, try to widen that gap as much as you can. That's going to allow those two polars to still have plenty of space, plenty of areas to kind of work into the next level. It's going to bring it obviously inside. Um, it's going to be, you know, still a way for us to get the ball to that C gap to the D gap. I think that's it. Oh, that's some good stuff right there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a good, it's a good variation, man. It's, it's something that we've, like I said, one of the big things that we've had a lot of success with is, is, you know, we're trying to track those explosive plays, um, you know, as a percentage of all the runs we've had. Um, and we run, you know, quite a bit from counter to inside zone to, you know, to power to, uh, you know, wide zone, um, lots of different variations with 11 personnel running the football, a lot of different things we do. Um, but that's probably our, our best run as far as, uh, as a percentage and explosive run. And that's not to say we don't have some negative plays with it because we do. Um, but a lot of times that's been one of our higher percentage explosive runs. Did Bartley you got anything else before I wrap this up? Coach, I appreciate you coming on here. You know, it's, it's one of those things I've, I've co last time I coached offensive line was 1998. Since then, I've, I was an offensive coordinator in there for four years, but I was coaching the running backs. And even then, I've been over on the defensive side longer than that. So, but I appreciate you coming on Absolutely. here to get, get me schooled up on this O line stuff I hadn't done in a while. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Well, it, it's good. It's good to have you back on our side. <laughs> <laughs> well, coach, I appreciate it. I'm going to wrap this up and then we'll uh, chit chat after I, I get done wrapping it up and hit it safe. Um, Coaches, uh, thank you again for listening to another episode. Again, uh, check out the bio in the below, uh, whether you're listening to this on one of the podcast apps or watching this on YouTube. Uh, Coach uh, Holscher's um, Twitter bio will be uh, in, the, in, the, in the description below. Uh, Coach Bartley's um, information will be in the bio below, along with his uh, link to his YouTube channel for his uh, defensive podcasts as well. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe everything as normal. Helps coaches find this video. Helps coaches, um, again, subscribe to our channel. Subscribe to Coach Bartley's channel. Um, and like I said, like and share the video. Thank you. And um, that was another episode of the uh, Gap Down Backer podcast.